must confess, that's never happened to me before. The, the strap breaks, the guitar falls down, and Harry is a hero because he had a spare strap. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. <laughs> anyway, good morning, everybody. Good Lovely morning. to be here. Uh, Greg is on holiday, hopefully enjoying himself with the family. And um, any announcements we have this morning? a reminder that uh, next Sunday, March 5th, is the deadline for the uh, nominations for our four new elders. So uh, the forms are out in the entryway together with the ballot box. Thank you. Any, any other announcements? Right. Uh, birthdays, special occasions, anniversaries. What have we got today? One birthday, aren't they? No, not Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hiding away. A milestone. Well, I, I, won't, I won't ask. I won't ask. <laughs> oh, oh, another birthday. Oh, last one. Oh, it still counts. It still counts. <laughs> That's great. Well, congratulations. Let's sing. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear you, happy birthday to you. Right, we have the, um, the lighting of the Christ candle. Oh, no lights. Who's doing this this morning? Thank you. Could you come and light the Christ candle? I've got a little Celtic um, benediction. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and we hear in Psalm 536, with you is a fountain of life. So I watched this morning for the light the darkness has not overcome. I watched for the fire that was in the beginning, and that burns still in the brilliance of the rising sun. I watched for the glow of life that gleams in the growing earth and glistens in sea and sky. I watched for your light, O God, in the eyes of every living creature, in the ever-living flame of our souls. If the grace of seeing were mine this day, we would glimpse you in all that lives. So grant us the grace of seeing this day. Grant us the grace of seeing. Amen. So let us pray as we open our service and we come before God this morning. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. And from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Come all you people.
come now to our prayer of approach. We'll say together, God of the hungry times, God of the, times, God of the difficult times, God of all the times of our lives, we need to talk. Sometimes it's difficult to understand the direction we need to go. With all the choices we have in our lives, sometimes we're not sure when to say yes or when to say no. So we ask for your guidance. We ask for wisdom. We ask for spirit in our worship, in our work, in our choices. Jesus, we share in that ancient prayer that he taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now have a reading of our song, please. <clears throat> please join me in the reading of Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, in your great kindness. In the fullness of your mercy, blot out my offenses. Wash away all my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my faults and my sins always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done evil in your sight. So that you are justified in your sins, and blameless in your judgments. Guilty have I been from my birth, a sinner from the time of my conception. Purge me with Casa, and I shall be clean. Let me hear the sounds of joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins. Put a new heart in me, O oh God. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and strengthen me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. O oh God, open my lips. Desire no sacrifice, or I would give it. The sacrifice you accept, O oh God, is a broken spirit. A broken and heart, O oh God, you will not children's time and teach you a new song but you'll have to stand for it because there's actions <laughs> um, Jesus love is very wonderful you don't you don't have to stand it's okay <laughs> anyway uh, Jesus love is very wonderful and it's so high you can't get over it 
It's so low, you can't get under it. And it's so wide, you can't get around it. So that's straightforward, isn't it? High, low, wide. <laughs> oh, and I better warn you, it starts off very slow. We're going to sing it three times, and it'll get faster as we go. OK. And you're welcome to do syncopated clapping, because I know you all know how to do that. So, uh, OK. Jesus love it very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful Jesus love very wonderful oh wonderful love so high you can't get over it so low can't get under it so wide can't get round it oh wonderful love Jesus love is very wonderful Jesus love is very wonderful, Jesus love is very wonderful, oh wonderful love, so high you can't get over it, so low, can't get round it, so wide, can't get round it, oh wonderful love, Jesus love is very wonderful, Jesus love is very wonderful, Jesus love is very wonderful, oh wonderful love, so high you can't get up, so wide you can't get round, so wide you can't get round, oh wonderful love. Very good. has come loose inside and it's hanging on its wires and doing that. Anyway, there we go. I'm all twisted, am I? Better, I feel much better. Thanks, Cindy. I've, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but I've never been called all twisted, I must admit. <laughs> Oh dear, well, it's the first Sunday of Lent. Sorry? <laughs> yeah? Oh gosh. So yeah, we, um, it's the first Sunday of Lent. And um, we've been talking, we, we sang a spiritual warfare song. I don't know whether you realize that at the beginning. And so everything was going wrong this morning. And so we need to pray about those things. And these... Um, there's a mention of the story of David and Goliath. We all know David and Goliath, don't we? So there's, there's some responses that I, I need from you. And uh, of course, David was a king, but he was also, what else? Before he became a king, can anybody tell me? What did he used to do? He was a shepherd, he was. So there's some sheep noises. Um, you can have Bartholomew, or you can have Barney, or you can have Lambert, or maybe Barber. Any Barbers here this morning? Oh, one Barber here this morning, that's good. <laughs> and then there's a lion also in the story. So what do lions do? They go, roar. Can we have it roar? Oh, I didn't tell you, every time you hear the word sheep. Very good. And of course, David was a musician. He used to play a harp. So we go, twang, twang, make sure it goes on and on. Very good. And he had a sling, didn't he? I did one, two, three. Try that, sling. Not too many slingers here, oh well. And then of course, what was in the sling? It was a stone. Ouch. Try ouch. Yes, yeah, stone. Very good. And then... There's some swooning going on as well. So how do you do swooning? I think just say swoon. Swoon. Or you could go, ah, oh, if you want. Anyway. And then Goliath, who's the bad guy. Grrr. We'll just run through that again. So sheep. Barbara. 
Lion. Harp. Oh, very good. In, in harmony, too, yeah. Stone. Well done. Swooned. Here we go. And Goliath. Okay, here we go. The story of David and Goliath. Now, David was a shepherd. A right plucky lad. He wasn't afraid of storms or lions or thieves or anything bad. He often used to sit and watch the sun as it went down. He'd play his harp and sing his songs as the sheep snored on the ground. His father's name was Jesse. He, in all, he had eight sons, but none of them was bright as brave as Dave, the youngest one. David had a secret weapon. He called it his sling. And when a lion crept up on him, he'd hit it with a thing. He put a stone in the pouch and swing it round his head. He'd shout like towers and run like mad and kill that lion dead. The sheep, they really rather liked him. They never had it so good. Dynamic Dave, they used to call him. Well, I suppose they would. Now, this boy's finest art came one Sunday afternoon. Amazing what you do on Sundays, isn't it? When this huge, great giant turned up and all the women swooned. They went alone. The men swooned too and scarpered pretty quick. And when David heard about this man, he wouldn't take no stick. He grabbed his sling. He took his harp and wandered into town. The men were shaking in their boots and hiding underground. Goliath was a giant's name. He was a gruesome brute. Not like David, who was cool. And the girls thought he was cute. Goliath was a real bad lad. That's better. He was really very bad. He'd come to pick a fight. He brought a huge great army and they went half an ugly sight. Well, they stood and stared out in the sun. It was just like high noon. And Goliath laughed when he saw this boy and said, give us a tune. He saw that David had his harp. <laughs> he thought he might just sing, but what he didn't see is cunning plan, his rather useful sling. Goliath said he'd kill them all he hated all the town. David didn't say a word. He smiled and just bent down. Well, Goliath ranted on and on and everyone got bored. Goliath. <laughs> keep up, guys, keep up. <laughs> and David got down on his knees and had a word with the Lord. The boy picked up five small stones and put one in his sling. And then he swung it round and round his head and he let fly with the thing. Goliath tried to head it off. Silly move to make. Because <laughs> a little stone, it cracked his skull. It didn't half give him a headache. Well, the folks went mad. Goliath dropped dead. And David said a prayer. He knew he could trust in the Lord. He knew that he'd be there. He grabbed his sling and smiled at folks and strolled back to his sheep. They didn't even know he was gone. They were all still fast asleep. <laughs> we have one more little song. And then the kids are going off with Kim, I guess. Right, good. Oh, we have to. Oh, we do. Right. Cindy's leading this one. Yeah. No. If you're happy, you know what you really can't. go kids thank you
look forward to it. Thank you. Fantastic. And she knows nothing about it. Isn't that nice? <laughs> okay. So now we come to our invitation to confession. You speak, O oh God, but we are not always listening. Sometimes other voices are louder or more persuasive. You show us your way, Holy One, but we're not always looking. Sometimes other ways seduce us to ease or power. You give us choices. Now help us to learn your will. Lead us, great spirit, to walk your way on any road that we travel. So now we're going to sing. You can remain seated for this, but um, wholly overshadowing. Spread your wings of mercy over me and guard my heart with true humility. No shadow of the darkness pressing in, only the holy overshadowing underneath your wings. Overshadowing. No refuge will I seek but God alone. No hiding place save only at your throne. Only the cross, the blood to wash my sin. Only the holy overshadowing. Underneath your wing, overshadowing, you are my shield and my glory. You are the lifter of my head, and though the storms may rage around me, I'll be safe with it. Neath the holy overshadowing, no refuge will my back to far to bear. Only the easy love bid me wait until these troubles pass. My heart will sing. Praise for the holy overshadow. Underneath your wing, overshadowing, you are my shield and my glory. You are the lifter of my head, and though the storm may rage around me, I'll be safe with. Neath the holy overshadowing, you are my shield and my 
Let us pray. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us all in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we sing Halle Halle, which you all know. Notice some wonderful harmonies there. That was because these guys know one version and I know one version, and we can't seem to get it between us. But it sounds good together. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Oh dear, given up. Oh my goodness, we have another song in a minute. Um, the last verse of this chorus, Wings of a Dove. I'm doing now, what's new, what's going on? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's lovely to be here, it really is. Um, we're going on holiday next week to Britain, and so this is kind of a fun day today, isn't it, James? It's not. I said it's a fun day today, <laughs> because we're going on holiday next week anyway. There we go. Yeah, we have the, the offertory invitation. The offertory will be brought up during the last chorus when these guys will stand up and give you the cue. I don't know who's doing the offertory today. Somebody? Anybody bringing the offertory up? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Just check. Just checking. <laughs> okay, Harry, you do your intro, please. Wings of a Dove by Sterling Husky.
Father God, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us day by day. We ask your blessing especially on the offerings that have been given today. In the name of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. We now have our two readings from Genesis and Matthew. First scripture this morning is taken from the Old Testament from Genesis chapter 2 verses 7 to 9 and chapter 3 1 to 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was not to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The New Testament reading is from Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, the testing of Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your feet against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world. And glory, and said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is a wonderful thing, isn't it? (laughs) 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God. Amen. Well, uh, we rightly in Lent, our text today and our readings, it all deals with sin, temptation, grace, and favor. Grace, no, not grace and faith. Grace and faith. And that first reading that we had from Dorothy, it tells us the story of Adam and Eve. They were tempted. They sinned against God in the Garden of Eden. It was perfect. It was paradise. But there in the middle of the garden was a tree, the tree of life, with the most beautiful fruit on it. And temptation came in at that point. And it became a blame game because after the fig leaves were on and they hid in the garden, God came walking in the garden as he normally did. And uh, he said, Adam, Eve, where are you? No sign. Adam, where are you? I'm here, Lord. 
I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? And then the blame game started. And Adam said, well, it was a woman. She, she tempted me with this beautiful apple. And the woman said, well, it was a snake. He tempted me, and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> and that second reading was about Jesus in, in the wilderness and living blamelessly in the face of faith of evil by the power of faith. There we go, got it right. Temptation, sin, grace, and faith. These are the, the great motives of our lives here and now in the world, aren't they? It's sort of the axis around everything else revolving. And as Christians, we believe that sin has power, a deadly power that comes from evil. And we also believe that faith has power, a life-giving power that comes from God to combat it. And I almost read the, the wonderful passage from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians where he tells us to put on armor to protect ourselves from the wiles of the enemy. And Paul was in prison when he wrote that letter. And he was actually chained 24-7 to a Roman soldier. And they had to keep swapping them because he kept converting them. It was lovely. And, um, but he used the Roman armor. It was the helmet of salvation, um, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sandals of the gospel of peace to walk in. And, um, and then the sword of the word of God because there's great power when you use the word of scripture. And in our lives, we experience a struggle between these two great powers, don't we? Even if we're on the side of life, even when we have faith in the life of God and the God of life, and we all experience temptation. We feel desires. We live through events that test our faith to seek us to lure us away from God and to have us serve evil instead. There's, I, lo I love... I love uh, mythology stories. Um, when I was growing up, we had a teacher that used to tell us Greek mythology stories. It was always exciting. At the end of the math lesson, he'd come out with another Greek mythology story. But I've got one here that's actually a Scandinavian one. And everybody's heard of Thor, either through um, films or whatever, or stories. Thor in, in, in Scandinavia. And he arrived, he found that giants were engaged in, in various strengths of triumph, of um, contests of strength, rather. And they asked him if he'd like to take part in their games. And he said, sure, being Thor, you know, big, strong guy. And so it's proposed, they, they proposed three tests for him, three tests of strength. And first, Thor was asked to drink all the liquid in uh, one of those big, large, two-handed bowls. Didn't look like a lot, he thought, I can handle that. But as much as he could drink of it, only a tiny portion of the liquid disappeared. And finally, he had to put the bowl down and admit defeat. And to him, the giant seemed sympathetic, and they proposed something, well, a bit easier for the second test. And there was a black cat walking by. And Thor was instructed to lift it up. He thought, oh, it's just a black cat. He grabbed hold of the animal, thinking it should be easy to hoist up. And, but he was straining and struggling, and he couldn't lift it. He couldn't even budge the cat. So he had to admit defeat. Well, by this time, of course, you can imagine the giants were beginning to be openly amused at Thor's predicament. You're supposed to be strong, they said, but it seems you're not. Well, we'll give you something even easier for your third test. So for the third test, the giants challenged Thor to wrestle a little old woman and throw her to the ground. Well, that wasn't really very kosher, was it? But he thought, well, they've given me the test, I better do it. So with every bit of strength that Thor could muster, he grabbed hold of this toothless old lady Pushing, pulling, he couldn't even lift her off the ground, twisting in vain. Couldn't meet the challenge. So humbled and dejected, he left the giants to head back home. But one of them went after him for part of the way and told him that there was magic in the contest. The cup, he said, contained the sea, and who can drink that? The cat was the evil in the world, and who is able to lift that up and take it away? And the old woman was time and who is able to contend with her. I believe most of us feel when it comes to the sin that is in the world, we're living in a land of giants. 
We're tempted to give in to despair, the despair that nothing can do will make a difference. The despair that says, you know, when you think all, you turn, I, I don't even want to turn on the TV half the time or listen to the news. The light of nuclear saber rattling from that mafia thug in the Kremlin. Droughts, melting glaciers, fires, hurricanes, mass shootings, the war, it just goes on. It's awful, isn't it? There's nothing positive or very little positive. We've had the games though. We had the games here this last week, which is really positive. I believe that it's one of the greatest temptations of our age, but do you know, we have within us one who is stronger than the world, one who is greater than the tempter, one who has triumphed over evil, both in life, as we see in that story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, and in death, as we see on the cross. Here we are in Lent and we're coming up to Easter. And three days later, the resurrection some people, most people perhaps, dwell too much on the negative side of things. It's almost like that game show Jeopardy, all the answers to life's problems are expressed in the form of questions, aren't they? They see the problems that exist all around us, but they don't lay hold of the solutions, of the good news that also exists all around us, of the salvation that is offered to us without condition or qualification. They despair on account of the giants, forgetting perhaps that story of David and Goliath. One small stone in his hands brought an end to the Goliath that threatened his nation, that caused King Saul and his mighty army to despair of ever being victorious. I don't know whether you've come across a man called Richard Lederer, uh, but he collects funny signs. And some are simply the result of people in foreign countries having difficulty translating into English. Um, he says that at the entrance of a hotel swimming pool on the French Riviera, there's a sign that reads like this. Swimming is forbidden in the absence of a savior. Think about that. And maybe the person who put up that sign knew English better than we might suppose, but not only swimming, but life itself should not be lived in the absence of a savior, should it? We have a savior, one who remembers who we are, one who loves us as a father loves his children, one who seeks to nurture us as a mother nurtures her, her children. And this savior has ventured into the same waters that we swim in every day. He's battled the currents, he's fought the foes, he's shown us that he's able to, and shown that we, when we swim with him, are able as well. Our savior remembers who we are and he loves us, he loves the best for us. He knows that we're weak swimmers, that from time to time we all flounder and thrash and sink. Remember Peter who tried walking on the water and Jesus was right there and he started to sink? And Jesus held out his hand. He knows the waters we are in, and that's why he's been appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Our Savior is our judge, as we heard in the words of our, that psalm we said together this morning. But he doesn't judge us for the sake of condemning us, does he? He takes no delight in catching us out in our sins. He has no joy when we hurt ourselves or hurt others. Rather, he reaches out to us, he calls us, and seeks to guide us and help us. And like all good parents, he forgives us and does all that he can to make sure that we start each day new and fresh and bathed in love. There's a man, a writer, a poet called Kenneth Filkins, and he's caught this beautifully in a poem entitled The Pit. You think of the pit? I'm just going to share a little bit of it this morning. Um, visualize, if you like, a great pit a great pit of your own devising, or perhaps one devised for you by others. Visualize a pit into which you've fallen and you can't get out of it. He, write, he writes this. He says, a man fell into a pit and he couldn't get out. Buddha said, your pit is only a state of mind. A Hindu said, this pit is for purging you and making you more perfect. Confucius said, if you would have listened to me, you would have never fallen into that pit in the first place. And a new ager said, well, maybe you should network with some of those other pit dwellers. A self-pitying person says, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. <laughs> a news reporter said, could I have the exclusive story on your pit? A federal bureaucrat says, have you paid on your taxes on that pit? And the county inspector said, do you have a permit for that pit? A realist said, that's a pit. An idealist said, this world shouldn't have pits. An optimist says, 
things could get worse, could be worse. And the pessimist said, things just got worse. But Jesus, seeing the pit, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. You know, pits are awful places to be, uh, particularly the pits created by the power of sin and temptation. But there is one who will help. There is one who has managed to avoid the pit and seeks to help us out of that. His name is Jesus. He lives and reigns with God. And with God, he is able, able to help, able to save, able to redeem. And not only is he able, but he's willing. And not only is he willing, he's already acted, acted to save us, acted to bring to the world a new day, acted to bring to each of us a new life. So don't dwell in the pit, don't accept the pit. Rather, reach out the hand to the one who has stretched out his hands for you and who still reaches out for us today. Reach out to Christ. Through Christ, reach out to others around you and let them know that there is a better life to be had, a life that is given freely to all who desire it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Harry is going to lead us in prayer. Bow for our Lenten prayer, please. O oh, gracious Lord, may your, may your church be a home for the weary, a shelter for the fearful, a strength for the weak, a place of healing and forgiveness to the troubled. We pray for all those who are spiritually hungry, for all those who have lost faith, who have lost hope. Let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Lord of life, we pray for the starving peoples, for all those without adequate food or shelter, all who do not have a home to call their own. We pray for the street people and all who have no one to care for them. Lord, bless the work of all relief agencies, especially our health workers and our service personnel. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. We come to you, O Lord of love. We give you thanks for our homes and loved ones. May we not take their love for granted. May we not be a burden to those whom which we serve. In loving each other, may we learn to your love for us. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Loving Lord, we pray for the families where there is misunderstanding, neglect, violence, or apathy. We pray for the homes of poverty and fear. We remember all those who have lost loved ones this week, all those who are caring for loved ones who are ill, and for those parted from their loved ones due to sickness. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Lord, in love, you welcome us home. You come to meet us and lead us to your kingdom. We pray for all those who have joy of your nearer presence, for our loved ones departed. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Amen. Our final hymn. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Cloudy pillar, lead me on. 
May the God of life with guarding hold you, the loving Christ with guarding fold you, the Holy Spirit guarding mold you, each night of life to aid enfold you, each day and night of life uphold you. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and those whom you love both now and forevermore.